Now, I'm not a paediatric anaesthetist. Uh, uh, Andrew knows that only too well, but he's going to tell us a little bit about some of his experiences with paediatric anaesthesia and BIS, and then we've got a couple of cases to start getting the ball rolling in terms of uh, what you as anaesthetists in the room would do, do in certain circumstances. Um, thank you, Guy. So, first of all, we'll start off with a little bit of a, um, a poll. So. First of all, in your paediatric cases, how often do you actually use the process DEG, whether that's a BIS or an entropy? So it's either not applicable, as you rarely anaesthetise children, 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75%, or 75 to 100%. So there's, there's the music. Okay. Not applicable as you rarely anaesthetise, but a few people use it occasionally, okay? So we'll continue with the lecture, otherwise it would have been, if it was all zero, then we'll just skip paediatrics altogether. Next, in children, what is your most frequent primary reason for actually using the EEG? Not applicable, because you rarely anaesthetise them, or if you do anaesthetise them, you don't actually ever use it. To prevent awareness, to prevent excessively deep anaesthesia, to guide for TIVA, or just for interest. So we can start. So interesting to guide Tiva, just for research interest occasionally to prevent. So it's interesting as well. And we'll come back to this in a minute. Next question. The youngest age, when do I actually consider BIS or entry to be actually reliable? Ten years, five years, two years, one years, or all ages? five years, two years, one year, all ages. Interesting. So I frequently get asked, so what is the youngest age group that a BIS or an entropy actually works? And it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because it's hard to know what you mean by does the BIS actually work? And it's, it's because the BIS or the entropy is trying to, the, the number they're trying to give you is this concept that it's de a depth of anaesthesia monitor. And as Jamie said before, there actually is no such thing as depth of anaesthesia. It's an abstract sort of construct. So if you're trying to say, does it measure depth of anaesthesia, and depth of anaesthesia is something that doesn't really exist as a real entity, then it's almost impossible to work out whether these machines actually work or not. So what we tend to do is we do experiments where you sort of turn the anaesthetic up and down and you see if the, machine, if the numbers go up and down, or you see whether the numbers differentiate between people being awake or anaesthetised. And for children, down to about the age of two, they, they work in that if you turn the anaesthetic up and down, then the numbers tend to go down and up. And provided you keep the BIS or the entropy less than 60, you can be pretty much guaranteed that the child will be unconscious. Less than the age of two, it becomes much more unclear as to whether they work. And that's partly because there's very little research that's done. And also, it's harder to actually do the research. It's harder to just fiddle around with, if, with an adult. You can enrol them in a study, and you can say, I'm going to give you all sorts of different concentrations of anaesthetic. It's hard to do that in children. And also, it's quite hard to measure consciousness in children. So if you're trying to see whether a machine actually works to, as to whether the child's conscious or not, if you can't reliably tell whether the child's conscious, it's difficult. In an adult, you give them a syringe, and you say, you know, turn up the anaesthetic until they drop the syringe and then they're unconscious. If you do that with a child, they just won't do it. And if you do it for neonate, they certainly won't do it. So when, what age do they work to? Well, probably down to about the age of two. And then under two, it's a little less clear whether they actually work. But the other side of do they work, you can look at it, well, do they actually improve the outcome? So if you sort of forget about the idea of it's a depth of anaesthesia monitor and say, OK, if we aim to keep the BIS less than 60, do you get a better outcome? And for paediatrics, there's almost no, there are almost no studies to actually show that it actually improves outcome, which was interesting in the previous questions, where you know, people don't tend to use it in children to prevent awareness because we don't really know what causes awareness in children. And we don't know whether depth of anaesthesia monitors will actually prevent awareness. 
And if we don't know the mechanism of awareness in children, you can't translate the research which is done in adults to children. So if you don't understand the mechanism of a phenomenon, then you can't translate the result of one trial in one population to it in another population. So just because the Be Aware trial shows it reduces awareness in high-risk adults doesn't mean that it'll reduce awareness in children. And uh, also we don't know whether it increases, out it improves outcomes such as uh, like nausea and vomiting. But interestingly, a lot of people use it for guiding TIVA, which was one of the higher uh, scores before. And that's uh, certainly in my practice, that's about the only time I use bisarentropy is to guide TIVA. But that's partly because the TIVA algorithms in children are woefully inaccurate. And so it's much more likely that the bis or the entropy will work. But just now to move on to a couple of more tricky ones. Hopefully. Aha. So, keep going. So first, we'll try it with an infant. So this is a 22-day-old term infant, bilateral inguinal hernia pair, sevoflurane uh, 1%, 1.5%, you've got a nice caudal block on, no other drugs. Now, the clinical sign, baby's not moving, mean pressure is 40 millimetres of mercury, heart rate's 110, and the bis is only 29. So you're giving slightly less than a MAC, about sort of two-thirds of a MAC of sevoflurane, very low bis, uh, but otherwise hemodynamically looks fine. And so this is, this is the real case. Uh, we were giving 2.5% for a while. They thought that was probably too low, so we turned it up to 1.5%. And so you're sitting here at about 1.5% SIVO, and the BIS is sort of in the high 20s. So what would you do at this situation? Would you do nothing? Would you give a bolus of fluid? Would you turn up the SIVO throne? Would you turn off the SIVO throne? Or would you just take off the BIS? Music. Do nothing, yep, give fluid because they're a bit hypotensive, turn up the sevoflurane, turn down the sevoflurane, or just get rid of the bis, okay. So this is, uh, well, this is a bit of, this is a case where, of course, most people wouldn't probably put the bis on a child of this age because you probably know that it doesn't work anyway. And interestingly, the reason why it specifically doesn't work in this age group is you get what's called trace discontinue. So infants tend to get a, a very, well, first of all, they have a very low voltage EEG and they very quickly go into a discontinuous pattern where they get a, a low modulated low frequency pattern. And what happens is that the bis and the entropy both interpret this as burst suppression. So typically, if you put the bis on a very, an infant, then you'll get a very, very low number very quickly. And that's because you've got this very low voltage pattern, which doesn't mean that the child's anaesthetised very deeply, it just means that the machine is getting tricked into thinking that the infant is in birth suppression. So if you turn down the agent, thinking that they're very deeply anaesthetised, then the baby will wake up. So the best thing to do in this case is the answer, the last answer, which is take off the bis. Next one. A four-year-old, bilateral inguinal hernia repair, sevoflurane once again, caudal block, no other drugs, clinical signs, not moving, heart rate 90, blood pressure 50, regular respiration, and it's at the end of the case, and just at the end of the case, you turned off the sevoflurane, the bis is slowly rising, and then it suddenly falls down to about 40. So yes, here it is in here. So the bis rising to 80, then suddenly falls to 40. So what will you do? Do nothing, expect the child to awaken soon and peacefully, expect the child to wake up with emergence delirium, check what the registrar just gave in the drip, or go back to checking your email. Next one. Okay, music. Nothing, check the link piece like, ah, this shows how many people went to the talk yesterday. Excellent. So the answer is probably two. And what has happened here, and this is very characteristic in preschool children at the, at the end of the case, if you keep the bis on and you let the children slowly wake up, they very, very frequently, the bis will plummet down to about 40. And that's a sign that the child is about to wake up and they should wake up peacefully. 
And that is because the child is having what's called hypnopompic hypersynchrony. And hypnopompic hypersynchrony is what's called a sleep transient. And when you come out of anaesthesia, sometimes you go into a sort of quasi-sleep-like state, or you actually do go to sleep. And in children, when, you're, when they're in very light sleep, they have a series of what's called sleep transients, which are very peculiar EEG patterns. And in this case, it's this slow or delta period, modulated delta, which occurs just before you wake up. And of course, the processed EEG looks at this very slow delta and thinks, well, you're deeply anaesthetized. What do you have to do about it? Nothing, it's just really a curiosity. But if you know, if you see that sudden fall in abyss, when the child's, you think the child has a very low concentration of sevoflurane or ISO or whatever, and you think the child's about to wake up, if it suddenly falls, then yes, the child is about to wake up. But this, it also underlines one of the principle that Jamie said, is that the, the EEG is very complex. There's all sorts of different things that are going on. And it's, it's very naive to think that you can compress everything in the EEG just into a power spectrum or into an algorithm or into a number. So that the more you get to know about the EEG and the more you look at the EEG, then the more you can actually use it and understand it in your anesthesia practice. So at this stage, I'll hand over, I think. Thank you. If you Thank you. Join the panel. Oh, look, I apologise, I forgot to introduce Andrew formally, but again, uh, he's well known to, to many of us. Um, he's uh, Associate Professor of Anesthesia, um, Paediatric Anesthesia in Melbourne, and I think Director of Research at the, the Kids Hospital in Melbourne, and enormously experienced in this area. So I think it's terrific to have him uh, with us today. Can I just ask a question of the panel? Uh, the synchrony pattern you've just shown, that's not just unique to children, is that right? Can we see that in adults as well? It's generally considered to be with children, but uh, you probably get variants in adults. Certainly adults do go back to sleep again, uh, the way that last case Describe, but probably not such a such a sort of big effect. Yep, it's uh, hypnagogic, hypnopompic, and hypnagogic hypersynchrony are both fairly typical for just children. Yep. 